Hello everyone, Sebastian Lacido here and welcome to Line Upon Line uh, where we study a book of the Bible. Uh, we're in the book of Revelations. We're going to begin chapter 2 today. I want to do a little bit of review in chapter 1 to, to get a running start. But first, if you are not receiving notes to our Bible study, uh, any of them, uh, you can go to our website, watchersofthetruth.com and receive notes. It's free. Receive notes to our Tuesday study on general uh, Bible study on Tuesday evening at 7, our eschatology and time Bible study Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern time, and then also uh, our line upon line, which is the book of Revelation. So they're quite lengthy. I mean, they're five, six pages per chapter. And uh, uh, also you'll have access to our curriculums and other study material. So today we're going to uh, start chapter two, but first I want to go back to chapter one and read the first four verses, sort of the intro to the book. So verse one says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And as we've studied before, a little review, the entire book, the entire end times, the entire story of humanity is about Jesus Christ. It's about him. It's about him becoming man, paying for our sins. The book of Revelations is, is a story of him uh, uh, and what, we, what uh, the final chapters are of this dispensation, the dispensation of grace, before he comes back and we start the millennial reign of Christ. But it's all about Jesus, even though we want to know about the false prophet and the antichrist and the seals and the trumpets, the bowls. It's all about Jesus. It's really about Jesus. We have to change our paradigm, our thoughts on that. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, the Father gave him, to show his servants things which, which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel and his servant John, who bore witness of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches at, that are at Asia Minor. So just the overview of the book again. Um, it's a single revelation that was given to Jesus from God and then from Jesus to John. And John is going to go through uh, several different experiences and he's told to write down what he hears, what he sees, and even at times what he feels. And then uh, also we're going to study today chapter 2 and then chapter 3. Uh, so when you look at the book, Chapter 1 is the introduction of John to Jesus, the glorified man Jesus. Uh, chapter 2 and 3 are sort of epistles. Uh, they're the seven churches in Asia Minor. We're going to take up uh, one or two of them today. And they're messages to those churches specifically. Uh, and we're going to talk about what that means for us and how we should interpret that. Uh, and then uh, chapters uh, 4 and 5. Uh, 4 is a, a picture of the throne room of God and how holy he is. And chapter 5 is about Jesus and how worthy he is. And he takes a scroll, which really uh, gives us all of the information from chapter 6 to the end of the book. And so God wrote that for him. He opens the seals and begins to read what unfolds both here on earth and in heaven. And so the intro of the book is that. So we know that the seven churches, picture if I was to write a single letter, but I wanted, to, I wanted it to go to seven individuals. So I had, a, I had for the sake of time and because I'm in prison, all right, he's on the Isle of Patmos in prison, I write the seven intros and then I write the letter. So there's the introduction, the seven intros to those churches, and then the rest of the letter. And then their scribes, just historically, their scribes would take that letter and they would start making copies for the church, for the leadership of the church, and then wealthy individuals would pay a scribe to get a copy of that letter. So when we look at, uh, at chapter 1, let's just go to chapter uh, 1, verse 17. And I want you to notice here, because John is the last living apostle. He's the apostle of the Lamb, the last one that walked with Jesus. He was probably Jesus's best friend. He was like his little brother. We see him actually sitting sort of on his lap. He would lean against him like a younger brother with an older brother. And so everyone else is gone. John's in prison. They tried to execute him, but they couldn't do that. Again, if you, if you haven't seen 
uh, our teachings on chapter 1. You can get those on YouTube or on Facebook. So in verse 17, it says, And when I saw him, John speaking, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades, or hell and death. Write these things which you have seen, and the things which, which, the things which are going to take place hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars are, that you saw in my right hand are the seven gold, and the golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So the uh, John sees Jesus. He has seven stars in his in his hand. Those are the angels which we're going to talk about today of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches themselves and so as in all of the book of revelation there's no secret hidden meaning or revelation uh, there's everything is laid out if symbology is used it'll be given to us it'll explain itself you know a lot of people are writing about the the coronavirus being the first seal and the crown having certain spikes and spike proteins it's nonsense okay uh, the book is, is written for us. It's written for the general public. There's no hidden theme within it. There's no hidden revelation. If it says there's a star, it explains what the star is. If it says there's a mountain, it says what the mountain is. If it says there's a beast, it explains the beast. And so, it's, you know, the heads, it explains the heads. So we don't have any guesswork. And so when you look at it, when you look at where we're at, the seven churches that John is going to write, that, that Jesus is writing to, that John is going to uh, give information to, are in Asia Minor, which is Turkey. Uh, and uh, so when you look at, uh, at Turkey, Patmos, where John is, is an island just off the coast. And so when you go on land, there are seven churches in a ring road. Uh, the, the one on the Mediterranean uh, is uh, Ephesus and so Ephesus is the capital it's the Roman uh, capital of that region of, of the world and so it's great commerce there's a lot it's the biggest city of the seven we're going to study that church today for sure but there's some information that I think we need to look at uh, from a theological standpoint there are three different interpretations of what these seven churches are I'll give you all three and then I'll tell you mine. Uh, first is the preterist, uh, it's called the preterist view. Uh, it's a prophecy that basically says that the book of Revelations was fulfilled in the first century. That everything we're reading and everything that happened, happened in the first century. Um, this is the most unpopular, it has so many holes in the theory, um, very, very few people believe it. Uh, you know, part of the reason is Jesus hasn't returned. Uh, the, you know, the Antichrist hasn't been revealed. I mean, so yeah, it's a real stretch. But the preterist uh, point of view is a point of view that scholars have written about. Uh, the historist point of view teaches that each of the seven churches are a time period. You know, so Ephesus, the first church, is the end of the first century. Uh, and then each of the other churches, all the way to the Laodicean church, which is the last church, is our church, the lukewarm church. And, you know, so, uh, so it, it goes through the churches. The churches are time periods or dispensation periods that the, that the universal church would go through. I think that's very unlikely. Uh, and the reason is that if you take all seven churches, and you lay out what Jesus is telling the seven churches, each of them, there are those churches with those issues in the earth today. In fact, if you look back, just the seven churches that he wrote to in Asia Minor all had different issues, you know, and, and so he's addressing those issues with churches that exist at the same time. And so when I look at the seven churches and I look at the Ephesian church, there's Ephesian churches out there, churches out there with the same 
uh, you know, same positive affirmation that Jesus is going to give those churches and the same negative, affirm, you know, negative uh, information that Jesus is going to give them. So I think that's very unlikely. And then the, there's the futurist view, which basically says the book of Revelations from chapter 4 through 22 occurs in the future. And so it, uh, the futurist point of view believes that is purely prophetic, that even in our time, in 2021, it's futurist. And so it occurs in the future. Chapter 1 through 3 is for the universal church, as I said. If you were a church in 1880, right, uh, and you could be one of the seven or have issues like one of the seven. And so this is the most common, uh, it's the most accepted point of view. And it, it basically uh, tells us that as we go through the seven churches, uh, these uh, positive attributes and negative uh, attributes about those churches exist in churches today uh, and so we need to look at them in that way. Jesus will address even uh, every one of the seven churches in a very special way. He'll open up with to the church, to the angel of the church of Ephesus. And so what he's doing is he's addressing the angel of the church, okay? So the angel uh, in the Greek language simply means messenger. So I, I believe, and it's commonly accepted, that the angel is not a physical angel that gets the revelation from Jesus and then gives that to his church. It's actually because he can get fired or let go. You'll see as we go. Um, you'll see that the angel of the church is the leader of the church. So it could be a pastor, a chief elder, it could be an apostle, uh, you know, not of the Lamb, but another apostle. Could be a scribe. Uh, in those days, a scribe sometimes was a leader because he was a teacher. So the angel is the person that is leading, the spiritual head, the physical head of that church. So it'll open with a specific introduction. The second thing, you'll see a specific identifier of Jesus, which is pulled from chapter 1. So as we read you know, to the angel of the church at Ephesus, you know, it, then verse 2 will be uh, information that's found in chapter 1 about who Jesus is. And then there'll be a pastoral statement, which will include praise, a rebuke, a correction, exhortment, uh, ex exhortation, encouragement, and assessment. Uh, sometimes they're positive, sometimes they're negative. And, and so that, that pastoral sort of epistle will go to that church and tell them what's on uh, Jesus's mind because this is red ink, it's Jesus speaking to those churches. And then there'll be some sort of encouragement to hear carefully, turn things around, get things right, and become an overcomer, become a winner believer. Uh, so in other words, you need to make these changes to become a winner believer uh, and move on. So when you look at when you look at this, uh, one of the biggest things that we studied in uh, uh, chapter 1 was the difference in the voice of Jesus. Uh, in the book of Revelations, uh, we see Jesus for who he is today. When John sees him, he faints. He melts because he's been glorified. He's seated at the right hand of God. And this man, Jesus, you know, is, is, you know shines like the sun. John can't stand before him. His adrenaline, his emotions, it was overwhelming, and he, and he passed out to the ground, and Jesus had to help him up. So when we look at the book, the voice is different as well. And so historically, here's what we see. In the Old Testament, Jesus was uh, the angel of the Lord. So Jesus interacted with Abraham. Jesus created all things, Colossians tells us, all things were created by him and for him. So Jesus created all things. He was there. He's the one who said, let there be light. Uh, in the God, so anything in the Old Testament about him was written about him. He inspired the writing about him. Yesterday we studied Psalm 22 where he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knew uh, that, had, had David write that, but it was about him, what he was feeling, what he was saying on the cross. And so Jesus always was. 
So we don't see him as the son of God, you know, the son of man uh, until his birth in, in Bethlehem and his life here on earth. We then see him as gospel Jesus. I say gospel Jesus because he walked as an example to us. He loved, he prayed for his enemies, he prayed for those that were killing him, and he wanted us to walk as he walked in the gospels. So then we come to his resurrection and ascension. In the epistles, we learn who we are in him, who he's made us to be, what we have as benefits in him, and how we're to live with him and in him and here on the earth. So when we get to the book of Revelations, we now see the Lamb of God, same person, but in the book of Revelation, he's going to be a conquering king. He's going to kill more people than any other human being when he comes back in Armageddon. Blood will be to the bridle of a horse for 200 miles. We're going to see him judge and separate men and women for eternal judgment at the end. He'll separate the sheep and the goats. So we see him as a conqueror. We see him as a king, a physical king who's going to come here to earth and rule and reign as a man here on the earth with us. We see him as a judge separating and sending people to eternal damnation and to heaven. And then finally, we see him as a husband or a covenant partner with us because there are, there's a marriage in Revelations 19. And so when we hear his voice here, when we look at the gospels, we see him telling Peter, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. This is before the Holy Spirit is given. So the Holy Spirit is given, and then we see Peter get things together. 65 years later, we see the voice of Jesus and glorified Jesus, and we see his voice much more demanding of us. It's much, much more demanding of us. He tells them, if you don't get it right, I'm going to take your church from you. If you don't get it right, I'm vomiting you out of my mouth. We're going to read that over these next weeks to the seven churches. And so there's a higher expectation on us. This is the epistle for us. You can't stay trapped in the Gospels with all of the Gospel messages. The Gospel messages are for us and how we live our life. We pray for our enemies. We, we do everything he told us in the Gospels. But the expectation of God the Father and Jesus is that we live wholehearted and that we live in a relationship of love with them. We're going to see that today. It's one of the messages in, in the first book here, that we're, our first church that we're going to look at at Ephesus. I want to keep these to about a half hour so we're doing well on time. And so when you look at this, uh, when we look at these, these are very important messages to us to understand. Uh, we're going to see some of the issues. I will draw out some of the issues that I see in the Western church. What I mean by that is the unpersecuted church the unpersecuted church, uh, all of the book of Revelations and all of the epistles and all of the gospels was written uh, during a time of general persecution. Uh, the, the people of God were uh, somewhat persecuted. Uh, the great persecution uh, came with Jesus's execution. And then, uh, you know, in 70 AD, we see the destruction of Jerusalem the Jews scattered, we see Christians being uh, tormented and killed, all the way up to 300, which isn't in the Bible. If you study his, history, uh, Maxim, the leader of Rome, persecuted Christians, killed Christians. So there was, there was uh, and then after that, they, they got it right. So I want to take up, let's go to uh, Revelation chapter 2, and let's jump into it. So Revelation chapter 2, and let's start in verse 1. Uh, it's in your notes. If you have your notes, you don't need your Bible. We, you know, we have uh, the scriptures laid out for you. So here it says, uh, To the angel, again, the leader of the church at Ephesus, write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now we just read that in chapter 1. It's a pull through. So there's the welcome to the church. There's an address to the church. There's something pulled from chapter 1. He said, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those that say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. You have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my namesake, and not become weary. 
Nevertheless, I have this against you. And I want to just stop there for a second. So I want you to see here, you know, again, Ephesus is of the financial center of uh, this, and it's the capital of the Roman province of Asia Minor. It's the largest city. It's on the Mediterranean. There's lots of idol worship there. Uh, in fact, one of the seven wonders of the world, ancient world, was the temple to Diana, which was there, um, and sexual immorality was there. So the positive affirmations that we just read was, I know your works. So Jesus is saying, I know your works. I know your patience. I know your labor in ministry. I know that you hate sin and disobedience. I know you're not quick. You're wise enough and, and you're not quick to accept what you test the hearts and minds of those. I know that you persevered, which means there's a long time period and you've labored faithfully for my name to the church. So he's saying, I know you have endurance. I know that you persevered. I know that you've labored. I know that you really understand the word and you rightly divide it. And I know that you, your works and your patience and your labor. He said, I know you're doing all of that for me. He said, nevertheless, I have this against you. And it goes on and it says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, where, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand, your church, from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I hated, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the, to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the, of the paradise of God. And so here we see the, this great positive affirmation from Jesus to the Ephesian church. And then he says, I have something that, that, I, that I disagree with. You've left your first love. You've left that intimacy with me. You've changed. You're going through the motions uh, by working, but you're going through the motions in your relationship with me. Jesus speaking here. He says, you've gone cold in our relationship. You're doing the things that you did, you know, uh, that you knew to do, and they became almost like a lifestyle to you. But the relationship, and here's the key, saints, to this. Your relationship, the revelation here is that Jesus cares more about relationship, more about our relationship with him and our love for him, more than he cares about our works, right? More than he cares about us teaching and all of the other things that I do in my life. Jesus basically is telling me, I want you to love me the way you love me when your heart was first open, when your eyes were first open, you were first illuminated I want you to love me with that intensity where you wanted to find more. You were searching for more. You were so happy to understand that I died for you and your sins are forgiven. I want that honeymoon relationship with you. You know, working and managing the church is, is great effort. You know, but the love and spiritual intimacy is what Jesus is looking for. This is very important. You know, in 1 Corinthians, you know, uh, chapter 13, it says that, you know, it says that, that love is more important than martyrdom. Love is more important than knowing the scriptures and teaching the scriptures and having the gift of prophecy. Love is more important than faith removing mountains. What he's saying is the relationship is more important than anything else. And, and so we lose this because what happens is we mature and we go through the motions of Christianity. We love Jesus. We don't love him the same way where we're just really seeking him and seeking time with him. What happens is we go through the motions. We're obedient to the word of God. We generally become volunteers at church and we help our pastor manage the church. I teach some community groups, right? You may be in helps ministry or parking lot ministry, kids ministry. But here's the thing. He wants us to maintain this level of love this level of intimacy that we had at the beginning. As we mature in the word, 
that relationship can change. It's very similar to a marriage. When you look at a marriage, that intimacy, that first year, that honeymoon period of you know being all in and and learning of each other, right? Growing with each other, you know, and then you know you start to have children and we you know, our jobs and we start to you know you could your marriage could grow apart where we're going through the motions and we don't have that fresh intimacy that we had at the first. That is the spiritual component that Jesus is looking for from this epistle written to the Ephesian church. You know, uh, and, and again, I want you to notice the voice. I want you to notice that he, you know, is basically saying, listen, you know, I, you, you're doing all these great things. Your church is thriving. The Ephesian church was thriving. It was a, it was a big church. It was a great church. Um, they have their own letter written by Paul to the Ephesian church. You know, but in, and here Jesus is, you know, telling them, I'm rebuking you because I want this love. You know, and so, you know, how do we get that? How do we go back to that? You know, when you when you read Matthew 22, Jesus, they asked Jesus, you know, which are the two greatest commandments? And he said, you know, which are the two great commandments in the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, your mind, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And another gospel says, with all your strength. He said, the second is likened unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. So love the Lord your God with all your, you know, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You know, that means all, all of it. And, you know, and all your strength. And the second's like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And he, then he goes on, he says, the most profound thing, uh, you know, that, that you, I've ever heard. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So he's basically saying, you know the book on prayer you love, the book on covenant you love, the book on the Holy Spirit you love, the book on, you know, uh, you know, on, on church history, whatever you love in Christianity, whatever you feel is your, you know, the strong suit of how God touched you and changed you. At the end of the day, answered prayer, the Holy Spirit, our gifts and callings, everything hangs on us fulfilling the first two commandments loving god with all of our heart all of our soul all of our mind what does that mean that mean what is our heart our soul and our mind it's our thinking it's our reasoning it's our memory it's basically we through our heart soul and mind we act we react we think we reason we plan uh, we make decisions in life and we walk through life our actions come from our heart and our mind. And so he's saying, if you love me with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, uh, with all of your strength, you're going to love your neighbor as yourself, but everything else will fall in place. And so that's what he's telling the leader of the Ephesian church. He's telling them, you, you guys are just going through the motions here. It's intimacy with me. You know, and, and so we'll get into this a little bit more in my Bible studies. We, we talked about this. We talked about Jesus. If you're not watching our messages, uh, please go to our website. You can get the notes in any of our messages for the last 52 weeks. So last week I taught on Jesus, the Lamb of God, who opens the seals and brings judgment on the earth that kills 25% of humanity. The Lamb of God, who is the king, conquering king, who comes back and destroys human beings that are in, that are in opposition to him that took the mark and worshiped the beast we talk about jesus the husband the covenant partner with us that leads us provides for us protects us we taught that last saturday and then this last tuesday we taught on you know what what jesus expects of us which is part of what we talked about today and you know why uh, because he gave his life for us he died for us and so that the gospel and i'm running uh to our time here today so you know if you want to really read read that the first uh verses here of of revelations chapter 2 verses 1 through 7 and then read matthew 22 verses 36 to 29 about loving the lord your god with all your heart soul and mind and then first corinthians 1 through 8 nothing else matters if there's not love it doesn't matter if you martyr if you don't love, if you're not loving Jesus with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, you know, you're, you're, you're missing it. You're, and it's rejection from him. 
we'll see that rejection for being lukewarm from the Laodicean church uh, when we get to chapter 3. So that's line upon line. That's uh, the first seven verses of the book of Revelation. Um, so chapter 2. Uh, again, please get our notes. Please share this with others. Have them get our notes. We're going to go through the book, and then we'll start a new book, and we'll continue to do this. Every Tuesday evening, as I said, 7 p.m., we have live Bible study. It's general Bible study, so it's a general subject. Last night, the name of the message is, you know, what he did for us and what he expects of us. Uh, and then every Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern, we teach eschatology end times. Last week, we taught about the Jesus the Lamb of God of Revelation. The Lamb is a king, the Lamb's a conqueror, the Lamb's a judge, and the Lamb's a husband. And so we, we looked at that. We looked at the scriptures pertaining to that. And then every Thursday we have a teaching, line upon line, verse by verse, through books of the Bible. It's not a deep dive. We're not going to look at a lot of Greek and Hebrew. And, and uh, you know, so there's other teachings. But this is a good overview to get a good revelation, as you did today, that, hey, the relationship's more important. You know, and I want to just touch on that. How do we get there? We begin to glorify and praise him. And when we praise him, how, how it helped me, because I was the Ephesian church at times in my life, where I was going through the motions and doing a lot of work. But, you know, when you begin to recount verbally in your praise and worship time of Jesus, you begin to tell him, I love you. I thank you that you took my sins and my iniquities, my transgressions, my shortcomings you took my 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 poverty and my sickness you gave me access to god the father you gave me a life you made me righteous and you gave your life for me you died for me when you were on the cross yelling my god my god why have you forsaken me you were taking my sins at that moment my transgressions even the ones i haven't committed yet on you so that i didn't have to take it and i could be righteous in the eyes of the father because I'm in you and I can call God my father and his ears are open to my cries and my prayers. And so, you know, begin to, to do that daily. And then also in your study and prayer time, begin to read, go back and read what he did for us. Read about how they, you know, uh, Isaiah chapter 52 says that he was so marred. I mean, they plucked his beard out. They beat him so bad because God had to be satisfied with his sacrifice. And he did that because, for us, for you and me. And, and, and sometimes we, we can't get the gist of it unless we really dive down and begin to read it and confess it to ourselves. So prayerfully read this book. There's blessings in it. The Bible tells us uh, in, in the first few verses that we read today, there's a great blessing in those that read it, hear it, and keep it. So, and it's not just the generation that will live it. It's, it was very relevant for that first century church, those five years, and then all the centuries since. So let's glean the wisdom from it. Let's walk loving the Lord, cherishing our relationship with him. Next week, uh, Thursday, we'll start in verse eight, and we'll study the next church in chapter two. God bless you and have a great week. Thank you.